Come on, you girls and great. Come on, you girls and great. Come on, you girls. Good Come morning you and welcome and to your midweek Ireland AM. Yes, listen, first up, a massive congratulations to the women's team. They are through to the World Cup. <laughs> the World Cup, yeah, unbelievable win last night. 1-0 against Scotland, away from home. Amber Barrett, a Donegal girl yeah. with the goal as well, dedicated it, obviously, to the tragedy in Creasa as well. well. It was a special moment, a special night, and listen, landmark. Well done. Yeah, unbelievable. well done. Unbelievable. Through to the World Cup, and in Australia. I know, yeah. Very good. Put the boys to shame, they are. Yeah. Now, coming up later on today's shows, we're going to get his opinion on this as well. Football legend Roddy Collins is going to chat about his sporting career, moving from player to manager, and why his wife is his rock. And the crime reporter with over 20 years' experience tells us why the real-life guard a hero has inspired his debut detective novel. Love it. Mm. What else we got coming up, Katya? Oh, we've got the queen of cosmetics, Charlotte Tilbury. She will be joining us to chat beauty, business, and treating us to a masterclass. Plus, we have gumbo stew in the kitchen and suit styles on the catwalk. But now, let's say hello and good morning to Derek. Hi, Derek. How are you? How's the weather looking? Hi, Katya. Not too bad at all out there this morning. It's a mainly drawing set to start. A couple of hit and miss showers. More showers on the way then later on tonight through the southwest. But guys, we're on the grounds here of you. City in Dublin this morning because we're off to check out Ireland's first ever satellite. Now it's due to launch in January and would you believe Ireland is the only country in Europe that doesn't have a satellite so Alan and Tommy maybe we could send it down under to Australia to keep an eye on the girls in New Zealand as well the World Cup. Come on you girls yeah. in green. Come on you girls Come on you girls in green. Are you going to get to go to would you go to space if you had the opportunity on the satellite? Of course you would. I would, if you were coming with me. <laughs> Absolutely. I'd be all, would you do it? Yeah. Love it. Oh, yeah. I would love that. OK, we'll catch up with you later on, Derek. Thanks for that. Now it's time to get the news here with Anne O'Donnell. Thanks, Tommy. Good morning. Well, it's another tough day that lies ahead for the community of Creasla in County Donegal as more funerals for the victims of last Friday's explosion take place. Hundreds are expected to gather to pay their final respects. Two victims of the explosion were buried yesterday and today three more will be laid to rest. 48-year-old James O'Flaherty, originally from Sydney in Australia, was living in nearby Dunfanaghy with his wife Tracy and son Hamish. His funeral mass will take place in St Mary's Church in Derry Beg at 11 o'clock this morning. This afternoon, Catherine O'Donnell and her 13-year-old son James Monaghan will be laid to rest. Their funeral mass takes place in St Michael's Church in Creeshla at 2 o'clock. The same church was also the venue for the funeral masses of Jessica Gallagher and Martin McGill yesterday, where hundreds of people turned out to pay their respects. The President of Ireland, Michael D. Higgins, is due to arrive in Creeshla this morning. He'll attend the funerals of the victims over the coming days and is expected to meet with the families of the deceased as well as members of the emergency services. Claire Regan, Virgin Media News. Ukraine's president has appealed to Western countries for stiffer sanctions on Russia after missiles targeted multiple Ukrainian cities for two days in a row, including the capital Kyiv, which hadn't been hit since early in the war. Vladimir Putin said the strikes were in retaliation for the damage caused to a key Crimean bridge. I am asking you to strengthen the overall effort to help financially with the creation of an air shield for Ukraine. Millions of people will be grateful to the Group of Seven for such assistance. When Ukraine will receive a sufficient number of modern and effective air defence systems, the key element of Russian terror, missile strikes, will cease to work. The man identified as the prime suspect in Madeleine McCann's disappearance has been charged with a number of sexual offences alleged to have been committed in Portugal between 2000 and 2017. Well, the new charges against the 45-year-old German Christian Bruckner do not relate to the McCann case. U.S. prosecutors have dropped all charges against a Baltimore man whose case garnered worldwide attention through the hit true crime podcast Serial. Adnan Syed served 23 years in prison after he was convicted of the murder of his ex-girlfriend Hay Min Lee, but his conviction was quashed last month. The fundaments of the criminal justice system should be based on fair and just prosecution. And the crux of the matter is that we are standing here today because that wasn't done 23 years ago. 
Although my administration was not responsible for neither the pain inflicted upon Heyman Lee's family, nor was my administration responsible for the wrongful conviction of Mr. Saeed, as a representative of the institution, it is my responsibility to acknowledge and to apologize to the family of Heyman Lee and Adnan Saeed. And finally for now, the British actress Angela Lansbury, best known as the crime novelist Jessica Fletcher in the long-running TV series Murder, She Wrote, has died. Lansbury died on Tuesday at her home in L.A. That's according to a statement from her three children. She died five days before her 97th birthday. For car insurance, van insurance or home insurance, call the quote devil. Unless, of course, you've got money to burn. Thank you, Anne Marie. And a very good morning to you at home, or if you're indeed streaming online on the player, we're coming to you live here from the grounds of UCT in Dublin, and we're off to meet the team behind Ireland's first ever satellite. Would you believe? So that's all to come in and around 7:35 this morning. Anyway, let's take an opening look at weather together now with Rona McIntyre on camera. This 12th of the month, and absolutely not a bad start out there. Still very dark, quite breezy out there this morning. Showers through parts of the northwest and across the upper midlands, through parts of the midwest as well into East Limerick and North tip in those uh, locally strong and uh, sometimes blustery southerly winds. Now right across today in fact we're going to see that mixture of sunshine and scattered showers. Any showers feeding eastwards and in behind it we're going to see a nice pick up in terms of those October rays and as that rain pushes through those winds will veer to the west. Have valleys of about 12 to 15 16 degrees in some spots. Finally then tonight it looks like it will be mainly cloudy across the southern half of the country the further north we go clear skies will prevail. That will allow for a good dip in those temperatures, one to four through parts of Ulster in and into northern Ulster. So quite a cold, quite a chilly night across the northern half of the country, a little bit milder than the further south, we think, back to five to nine degrees. So that's how we're shaping up here in UCD in Dublin at the moment. We'll catch you back live at 7.35. For first-time drivers, young drivers, returning drivers, if you've had an open claim or have had too many penalty points. The quote devil's always got one hell of a quote. Now, from the girls in green to war on seagulls. Come on, you girls in green. <laughs> uh, we're going to have all today's top stories. That's coming up after this short break. You're very welcome back to the show. Now, we're starting with some good news. For a change. After the girls in green are going through to the World Cup in Australia next year. They certainly are. And Deputy Political Editor with the Irish Independent and the Sunday Independent, Hugh O'Connell, joins us now. Good morning to you. It's How nice you? to start with a good news Isn't story. Isn't it just, yeah, after such a difficult few days yeah. for the country, I suppose. What a, what a great story. I mean, Ireland qualifying for the, the World Cup for the first time in the 49-year history of the, um, the, women, the international women's team and the, a great story, Amber Barrett, who um, a native of Donegal, her grandparents from Creasley, as she said last yeah. night, she knows the area like the back of her hand and she slots home the winner after, uh, with 20 minutes to go, less than 20 minutes to go. I just heard her speaking in the news there. Yeah. I hadn't seen that last night. She was... Like, what a spokesperson mm -hmm. for, for what a historic occasion that was mm -hmm. last night, mm -hmm. but also in, mem in memory of the 10 people that yeah. lost their lives. She was just incredible. Yeah, she was, you know, really articulate and she really conveyed, I think, this, the sense of emotion that she felt yeah. and that some of her teammates felt about the... Uh, in fact, all of her teammates, I think, felt yeah. about, about the last few days and about this extraordinary achievement for the team that, you know, has come through such adversity in and of itself. I mean, it's only a few years ago that there was these horrible stories about them having to changing, change out yeah. of FAI yeah. issued tracksuits in, mm -hmm. in the airport. And look, the FAI has been obviously in a lot of turmoil over the last few years and the travails of the men's team. And we saw the draw for the Euro 2024 uh, tournament over the weekend. <laughs> and you're going, oh God. It's not, not yeah. good for the prospects of qualifying for that tournament. But before that now, we'll have the women's team in Australia and New Zealand next summer. And it's going to be a great occasion. I think people are really going to get into it. Like, you yeah. can see the interest last night, and it's only going to grow as we get to next summer. It, you know? It's going to be the next How Italian big is it, Tommy? It, How big is it? Well, this will be huge. This is a landmark moment, yeah. Alan, because you just mentioned it there. You talked with the tracksuits. It was 2017 that mm. the girls were having to turn up to the airport, get handed tracksuits that they were going to have to hand back, get changed in the airport toilets. Mm. Like, they didn't have access to the gyms. Yeah. They didn't have access yeah. to nutrition. Yeah. They weren't it, being paid. 
behaved the same as the men? Absolutely not. You and know? they made a massive moment. They stood, a, a group, I think there was 10 or 20 of them stood in a green jersey and it just had respect written yeah. across it. And that's all they wanted. Now they have pay parity with the guys. They get great nutrition. They get all the, the mm. same facilities that are handed to the guys. And listen, look what and it's done. the World so, Cup. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we're trying to promote women's sport and something like this. Yeah. The Irish team going to the World Cup will have a massive impact And when you on saw how forward. it affected England when England won that time where yeah. with huge, the English with the women's crowds team. crowds at Wembley like for the huge final. Huge crowds yeah. at Wembley and, and then in, in Leicester Square and thousands yeah. of people coming out for um, so brilliant. So, so it's brilliant. And uh, listen, I, and I'd love to know from people at home as well. Did you watch it last night? W were you dressed up in the green? Did you have the little girls dressed up watching yeah. their future here as guys and girls? Uh, send through your pictures. We'd love to see some pictures and kind of shout out a bit of good news this morning. 0896 triple one triple one. Now, but the good news doesn't continue for very long <laughs> because no, I mean, we could have much the time perfect storm about of good COVID nineteen news. and flu this winter. Yeah. So this is the the twin demic that we've been hearing about over the last few weeks, which is, as you say, this perfect storm of, of a high number of COVID cases and a high number of flu cases, because we haven't really had flu in this country over the last few years because of social distancing mm. and people keeping apart. But obviously, that the HSC is worried now about the, the prospect of the, the hospital system being overwhelmed. So at the worst case, they're predicting 17,000 people, I think, hospitalised with, with COVID and 4,000 or thereabouts hospitalised with with flu. Um, so the government has come up with this plan, 169 million being put towards it to hire more hospital consultants, more nurses and uh, set up more beds as well in a bid to stave off the worst of this and, and keep the health system up and running over what the winter months. What state is the health system in? Given mm. we've had two years of mm. money being pumped into it, yeah. like is the bed situation better than it was a couple of years ago. Like we're hearing all the time, we have well, a shortage of nurses, yeah. shortage here. of doctors. Trolley gridlock and gruelling waits are inevitable. It was ever thus. Uh, that's the winter in, in the, the Irish health system and it, and it always has been. And it's, it's, it's not going to be any different, I think, this winter. Um, and, you know, I think, you know, yes, the health system is in a better position because there is more money in it and there are more beds. But, I mean, the waiting lists are longer than they ever have been. There's already... There's a huge a build-up of problems that were kind of put off during COVID-19 mm. uh, that are now all coming coming to bear. So it's going to be another challenging winter, I think. I was listening to someone in the system yesterday talk about there's over 500 people on trolleys at the moment. Yeah. And this yeah. we haven't even hit the yeah. really cold mm -hmm. weather yet. Yeah. Uh, and the Cabinet were told about contingency, contingency plans to reintroduce the types of public health restrictions yeah, that so, were in place. So this is kind of a, I suppose, a worst case scenario. This is in a scenario where a new variant of COVID-19 yeah. emerges, which is more serious and more deadly than what we've, well, we've, been, we've all been getting, I yeah. suppose, over okay. the last year or two years. So this is, I suppose, at the moment, an unlikely scenario, what but it is if? nonetheless a scenario uh, whereby a new variant emerges uh, it's more transmissible, it's more deadly, the vaccines maybe aren't as effective against it, so then we might have to go back to the sorts of restrictions that dominated oh, our lives in 2020 God. and 2021. But I think that's pretty remote. Yeah, yeah because Leo Varadkar, who yeah. will be in charge when well, maybe exactly, this all yeah. happens, yeah. has said that the government expects to manage the current rise without yeah. having to impose any And we do know that, that he certainly, I think, is a, is a bit more resistant to imposing the sorts of restrictions that we had than, than other members mm. of the government. So I think it'll be, um, it, it's a remote prospect at this stage that we'll go back to those sorts of measures. Well, we measures could maybe rather. see what? maybe masks on public transport We could see masks again, on public on transport. Things, small but things like that. I think we're already seeing, I mean, I'm seeing kind of around the place people wearing masks a lot more uh, in crowded spaces and, and so on because there's, a, there's quite yeah, a lot of COVID yeah, around yeah, at the moment. You know? What about vaccination and PCR yeah. tests? Yeah, so like, again, this kind of worst case scenario plan is to stand up all of the systems that we had in place across the kind of emergency phase of the pandemic, which was we were able to do 150,000 PCR tests a week. Uh, everyone was getting rapid antigen tests. Um, and then vaccination, that in a scenario where it's recommended that everyone gets a vaccine or everyone gets boosted, that we would have the why mass vaccination centres anyway? coming up. Why aren't they Like, why aren't they... Like, well, I, the, well, like, because I mean, I mean, the there's over... no point in having mass testing centres no, lying testing. idle across the country. Not testing, but the vaccination. The, yeah. Like, there's no real urgency I can see at the moment to get people... Uh, well, uh, there really, I think people are being encouraged to go forward and get their vaccine. And I think actually, from what I heard yesterday, the numbers of people availing of a booster mm -hmm. jab in the last uh, couple of weeks are, are significantly up. 
So I think you're going to see a big public information campaign in the next few weeks for people who are eligible. And it's, it is a, a cohort of people only. It's, I think it's over 50s who are eligible for a second booster and those who are immunocompromised. But is there an argument perhaps that the entire population should, should get their second get it, booster? Yeah. I mean, I, I think it's last December was the last time I got a booster. Yeah. So, you know, that's You've, 10 months ago. It's waned, ago. it's gone. Because, yeah. yeah, I think a lot of people under 50 are in the same position thinking, should I get a booster? But internationally, we're not seeing other countries do this at the moment. I think bo second booster their populations. But I think as we get deeper into the winter, that's definitely yeah. a prospect. Uh, again, I'd love to know from people at home, 0896 111 are you, you get looking, a second booster? Are you looking for your booster? Yeah. Or is it available? Or do you kind of feel that you're going to try and see out the winter without I it? I would definitely get now, one and get the flu vaccine well, yeah, as well. Sure yeah. Can. Yeah. Listen, well, let's they're free as well. I, yeah. That's yeah. The other thing. I love this story. This yeah. is insane. <laughs> um, so a DUP councillor has called for seagulls to be fed contraceptive pills in a bid to control I think their it's a numbers. Fine Gael councillor, is it not? It is uh, Avian Tormey, yeah. Fine Gael councillor. Yeah. Yes. So she's yeah. representing Hoth and Malahide. Mm. So she's obviously been out eating chips outside uh, Bashoffs and Hoth. And uh, has I've been, been there. I tell you what, they are frightening some of these seagulls. Though. Yeah, they're yeah, yeah, and they're everywhere. You know, yeah, we, yeah like it's. It's a big problem. People get very annoyed about it. Uh, you know, I know that on my road there was a seagull's nest on one of the the roofs in in the uh, in the chimney, and you know, squawking at all hours of the oh, day. Right. So the, a big problem, I think, um, that uh, well, Tormey the, has proposed a, a quite radical solution. Yeah, what to. is it? The con what do you mean, give a contraception? So basically, pills? that they would stop breeding, um, so that you would have fewer seagulls. So this is she's citing an idea in Belgium where they add a, contra a special contraceptive pill to the bird feed <laughs> um, in in Belgium, and that has reduced the seagull population. Therefore, you have less disruption, you have less uh, prospect of people being attacked by seagulls or their food being taken by seagulls on the street or them just nesting all, along residential roads and squawking at all hours of the day. But I think the, the RSPCA or the DC, DSPCA are pointing out uh, that... We, we can't not mention the DSPCA and mention who their <laughs> representative is. Mm. So Gillian Bird. Bird. Yeah, nominative determinism <laughs> at, at, its, at its best. Um, and she's pointing out, I think, that there's all sorts of unintended consequences for this, which is that... Uh, what if uh, other species get into this feed and and eat these contraceptive yeah, pills? Or, yeah. What what that m might have? Uh, what impact that might have in terms of uh, rare species, endangered species? Would they be wiped out by this? And I think she raised the prospect of a kind of a Simpson style scenario where you'd have. Uh, animals going around well, with three the, eyes. If so if, if, if they're very much against it. So I'm not sure this idea is going to. Uh, if foxes eat purchased. the birds or if rats eat the grain, I mean, where does this go? Now, the big thing she did mention as well is actually it's about the, the waste system mm. around the coast. And we've mm. seen it all mm. summer as well. Bins just yeah, overloaded overflowing. with rubbish as well. And if they sorted yeah. that out, that animals will reproduce based on the amount of food that we give them. But again, this should be an interesting one. 0896 111 I mean, it's the bane of my life when I see bins overflowing like that and people yeah. still going over instead of just taking it away but i don't think the solution is to you know wipe out the birds no no well, i'm saying, I'm saying get, the, get the county councils to clean up their bins absolutely yeah, or put yeah. more, oh, eight, more nine, six, bins triple one, triple one. Get, does that really frustrate you and how scared are you of the seagulls and alan this is one for you as well i mean a sad day angela lansbury from murder she wrote yeah died 96 i interviewed years her age. a couple of years ago an absolute lady mm. she really is yeah. One of the richest women in television at, at one stage. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And well, nominated she, she... for three Oscars, which I never knew. No, amazing. I, mean, I always associated with her with Murder, She Murder Wrote. Murder, She Wrote. Yeah. And, and did a, did huge, did a huge did stage did. actress. She loved her stage work as well. Like going to MGM with Judy Garland and stuff like that from the early days. I mean, she was a real legend. Uh, listen, everybody, everybody grew up Lensbury. watching Murder, She yeah. Wrote, though. Amazing. What a, a landmark show that was as well. Hugh O'Connell, thank you so much. Thanks Deputy much, uh, political editor with the Irish Indo and Sunday Independent. Great to have you with Thanks us. Thanks a lot. Now, still to come this hour, Derek is going to learn about Ireland's first, first ever satellite. We're getting a satellite. Get shot yeah. Off yeah. It. <laughs> Plus the challenges facing entrepreneurs in the cost of living crisis. We're back after this. It's time now to take a look at today's papers and we're starting with the Irish Independent. The headline reads, A Time to Mourn, and it pictures some of the mourners attending the funerals of the first of the ten blast victims laid to rest yesterday in the broken Donegal town. We will walk with you all in your pain as the front page of the Daily Mail. The star's poignant headline found in Dad's loving arms. First responders found the youngest victim of the Crystal Explosion, Shauna Flanagan-Garway, in her daddy's arms. 
it breaks my heart that. Moving on to the Herald now, which goes with fall of the gunman empire. Jonathan Dowdell's shock decision to give evidence against Jerry the Monk Hutch could now lead to other members of the gang facing serious criminal charges over the 2016 Regency Hotel murder. The mirror goes with Maddie's suspect on Irish girl rape rap. The Irish woman allegedly attacked by a German suspect in the Maddie McCann case hopes to finally get justice as the man has been charged with several other sex crimes. The Examiner's main headline reads, Anger at plan to move Ukraine refugees. Last gasp efforts are being made to avoid more than 135 Ukrainian women and children having to be relocated from Killarney Hotel to Westport in Mayo today. And finally, the Irish Times goes with next year we will feel like a recession. The IMF warns that the International Monetary Fund has cut its growth forecast for the global economy for the fourth time this year, blaming the deteriorating outlook on the war in Ukraine, rising inflation and a slowdown in China. And also pictured on the front pages are the girls in green celebrating their fabulous World Cup qualification last night. Oh. I'd say they're all on cloud Absolutely nine. Absolutely brilliant. Right and you know what? Oh. You might be able to see them. Derek. Oh, yeah, with the new well, satellite. Well, he's up there on <laughs> cloud nine. Derek, beam me up, Scotty. How are we getting on? <laughs> Absolutely, beat me up is right, guys. I'm absolutely fascinated by this project because we are about to send our first ever satellite to space. We're here in the engineering building in UCD in Dublin, and one of the team members behind us is Dr. David McKeown. Davis, why are we the last ones in Europe? <laughs> well, I don't know why we've been so slow, but we're catching up quickly now. Um, so, last one in Europe to build a satellite, Ireland's first one, looks a bit like this. Um, so it's a bit the size of a shoebox, but there's a lot more than a shoebox. Uh, so we've been building it for five years, and yeah, eventually we're getting to the last few months. It's going to be shipped off from UCD in the next few weeks, heading uh, towards French Guiana to be launched, and then the launch into space. Now, tell us about the satellite itself. Obviously, this is a replica because we cannot get into the lab because it's highly protected. Yeah, so at the moment we're under strict control for dust and hairs and stuff like this, so we're not going into the clean room. So this is the same size as it is, um, so it's, it's got a lot crammed inside it. So it's a small package, but lots of crammed. So all the full things that you have in a normal giant communication satellite are all crammed into here. Uh, especially for us, there's a few Irish payloads, so things that um, Irish companies or, or the research institutes here have built. Um, so we have a gamma ray burst detector. Okay. Uh, which uh, detects gamma rays that come across the universe and uh, it, our, our satellite picks them up and gets excited about them and, and tells us back here on Earth. Um, it's got some thermal coatings on the top, there's some, some black and white squares and that protects the satellite or uh, could protect people or humans as we travel through space. Uh, so that's from an Irish company called Mbio. Uh, the black stuff's made from charred cow bones. Uh, that's plasma treated onto uh, surfaces. That's Amazing. great thermal properties. Do we have solar panels here as well? Solar panels on the side, that's how we, how we charge it up. It's got batteries inside, uh, just like your phone. Um, so it takes its, its energy from the sun. Uh, and that, that keeps it from keeps it warm and uh, keeps it, all the experiments working as we go along. Now you've teamed up with the European Space Agency, so this is a kind of a European project, isn't it? Yeah, so it's under the European Space Agency Fly Your Satellite Programme, so they're going to provide the launch for us, um, and they've been providing some expertise, and they worked with yeah, us here in engineering and, and the School of Physics, uh, so we've had about 15 students working on it at the moment, maybe about twice of that over the whole five years of the project. Um, but yeah, we're part of the European Space Agency. There's loads of Irish companies working there. And uh, yeah, this is, this is part of that. And you're trying to get kids involved as well. There's a little comic book gone out to all the primary schools. Yeah, so it's, it's Ireland's first satellite and we want people to get excited about that. Uh, so yeah, we've, we've created a comic book about AirSat. Um, we give lots of talks. Uh, we like to tell people as much as possible because we want them to get excited, learn, ask us questions mm. uh, and find out more. So you're not actually looking for people with this thing. You're actually just going into the universe and looking beyond that. Yeah, we're looking at uh, instead of down. Um, yeah. So yeah, we're trying to find out more about how the universe was, was formed, what's happening there. Uh, so big, big questions for, for physicists. Um, and in engineering side, well, we just want to be know that we can we can build this and build uh, better ones and, and get the skills out there and build up the industry in Ireland. Um, so there's a lot of new companies. Uh, very exciting time for space. It's not just America and big rockets and Russia and big rockets. Yeah. It's it's small countries being able to build satellites. Um, so Ireland wants to be part of that. So we're training up the people to do and that. And I know you're headed to French Guiana. Would you not launch it down in the square in Tala? I know. It'd be, <laughs> be a lot easier. Uh, a lot easier to throw it off the top of the square. But uh, 
Does, it, does the European spaceport in, in French Guiana, where all okay. the European rockets go from? Um, so, yeah, it's going to get uh, packed up nice and tight and uh, clean, and it'll go down there onto a, what's called a Vega C rocket and up 520 kilometers into the sky and a road go around the Earth. Go around the Earth. Wow, that, absolutely fascinating. I'm loving the work here you're doing. Before we let you go, if you were to go into space, who would you go with? Have to go with my wife and kid, Elsie. Oh, I'll see oh I thought you were best. going to say Elon Musk. No, no. <laughs> Maybe Terry or All right, there we have it, guys. Airsat, uh, airsat.ie, isn't that it? Yeah. Uh, the website, if you want to check out more online. Uh, but for now, we'll, we'll be having a little pre-launch, maybe, will we? <laughs> Back <laughs> to you guys in the studio. <laughs> Thanks very much, Terry. What oh, is it, like a you. satellite for ants? <laughs> Oh, no, that's me. That's, no, that's me. It's that's amazing. amazing. We were all going, what? I, I, I think we were expecting this big, dish. massive a dish yeah. type thing. I yeah, know. That's what we were thinking. Like, I'm not going to be going up to space and that. But I mean, I to think that but takes five years. And can you imagine the intricate, like, everything that goes into that? Yeah. It is incredible. It's but incredible. I did pays it. for it? Well, they, they, I'm sure the government or whatever else, it's Ireland's first ever satellite. satellite. I think, it's a big deal. To say we're like the yeah. biggest, the only country to not, not have, have a satellite. Yeah. So, great, well now. done. Love this stuff that they're doing over there. Fair play, Derek. Well, it's time for a quick break, but coming up next, we speak to three entrepreneurs. Stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. Now, it's more important than ever to support local businesses with the, well, the cost of living crisis at the moment. And with me now is Laura Sinnott from Wexford Preserves. Good morning to you, Laura. Hi, Alan. How are Tell you? us about Wexford Preserves because you're going, it's in business 30 years. Yeah, yeah. So we took over the business from my husband's Aunt Ellen in 2008. Um, I was made redundant. Tom was looking for a gear change, I suppose, in career. Our skill sets matched. Um, Ellen was selling the business, so it all kind of fell into place. It all aligned for you. Yeah, yeah, so we did. And Ellen came to work with me for a year to teach me the recipes. So that was... So tell us about the range then. So uh, we started off with eight products and now we have maybe about 50 products. So, oh, wow. Yeah, we started expanding. Um, we realised we needed to fill gaps in the market, so we, we developed a Christmas range, we developed a gifting range, um, and then um, Dunn Stores approached us. Yeah, I mean, because so, uh, when people see they say that you're sim the Simply Better range in Dunn Stores, you go, how does that happen? How does our range get into every yeah. supermarket around the country? Yeah, well, sure, we got, a, we got a fright. Like, they approached us, the team, the Simply Better team, and we said, oh, God, you know, I don't think we could do that volume, like to do nationwide, done stores, simply better stuff. So uh, they said, no, look, we really love your products. We'll work with you. We want you in the stores. Yeah, you know, and we'll, you know, whatever you can do, we'll start off with. And how many people do you employ? We have, we started off with just a few of us. There was myself, my husband, mm. my brother, and now there's 14 of us. 14 of you. And you're yeah. expanding all the time, because obviously are, you yeah. need to. Yeah, with the help of Leo, like... So, let, yeah, the local enterprise office, so how do they help you? Yeah, so, um, God, they've been with us from the start. So I started off with a Start Your Own Business course. I've done an owner-manager course. Um, we, when we moved to a bigger premises, uh, when we got the, we started working with Simply Better, they uh, um, helped us with a business expansion grant. So all the way along, there's supports to help, you know. And, and, and I see there's awards here. You, you won a Bloss Award and you have an yeah. award over here. Yeah, yeah. So we, we enter awards all the time. It helps motivate us. Um, so, and our team, our, our team are absolutely fantastic, but... Yeah, and it keeps it keeps your your company name in mm. in the you know in the limelight, I suppose as well. Yeah, and you've different preserves and different you've raz you've jams you've um, yeah. you've different things We've here chutneys, as well chutney marmalades. marmalades. Yeah, yeah, we we're very picky about our ingredients. So for the marmalades, we go to Seville and Sicily. We work. Yeah, you go to Seville with the family. Yeah. I love it <laughs> to pick oranges. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we well, we work with two family farms, one in Seville and one in Sicily. And we know them, like, we go to see them. Yeah. Um, they're great as well. And and then at home, we work with local growers, so black currants, we have Des Jeffers. Yeah. 
And that's um, really important, isn't oh, it, as well? So, yeah. yeah, it helps with our sustainability, everything. You know? Laura, continued success with it, and thank Thanks, you very Alan. much for thank joining you. us this morning. Now, Tommy, what have you got? I tell you what, Laura, if you want someone to go over to Seville with you, he's your man. <laughs> okay. Now, I'm here with Lisa Gagan from Sun of Life, a business that is so important at the minute. It's all about building a better community experience. Good morning to you, Lisa. Uh, tell us a bit more about Sun of Life and why you just started, decided to start it. Yeah, perfect. So Sun of Life is a community management company and we're all about creating a sense of community specifically in property developments. And we do that by organising a range of community events and experiences. And I'm delighted to say that we're now operating in over 2 million square foot of real estate. Wow. So Yeah, I know it's uh, going really well. I'm delighted. And my background is in property. So I'm a chartered property surveyor and I also am a qualified wellness practitioner. So back in 2015, I really started thinking about the way that we live life. And I suppose from my own perspective, I used to work in an office, used to spend the majority of my week there. Then I'd barely have time to grab lunch. I might get a sandwich, come back to my desk, work through lunch, get home at whatever time in the evening, home to my apartment building where I didn't know anybody. And I just thought, this, surely there has to be a better way to be living life than this. And in 2017, I created the very first community engagement program in a property development called Central Park in Leopardstown. And the concept behind that is all about creating opportunities for people to connect, get to know each other and build better relationships. So that could be literally something as simple as pop into a yoga class during your lunch break or going to the food market that we organise and we'd also have live music or entertainment and it's just giving people little opportunities to take a break, connect with people and just add value to people's daily lives. It's a brilliant idea. I think that so many people will relate to this, particularly with the pandemic because we all were stuck at home and in apartments where we didn't know anybody. How did you adapt to that? Oh, don't talk to me about the pandemic. Like, you literally couldn't make it up. We're a community management company where it's all about bringing people together and then we're six months operating and we have to be told that we can't meet up in but real life. But did you run online then? Oh, 100%. So thankfully we adapted the business and we organised all different types of online experiences, classes, workshops, you name it, we've probably done it. I mean, we had knitting clubs, we had wine tasting experiences, running clubs going and Really, I have to say that was one thing that kept me going during COVID, even myself. Like seeing the responses we got from the community was so fulfilling. And actually to see that we're making impact and adding value to people, um, you know, it was absolutely I know great. so many people who would really enjoy that. Community is what it's all about. And I know the local enterprise office, you were telling me, helped you set up your website, helped you get grants that has been able to make you expand. And of course, giving you lots of mentors as well. Lisa from Sun of Life, thank you so much for joining us. Now let's get outside to Katia for our third business. Thanks, Tommy. Cuteness overload over here. I've got Francis O'Reilly and Luna from Dog Joy. They're here with an amazing new doggy product. So thank you so much for joining us, by the way. I see Luna has her dog dry robe on. Tell us all about it. So it's a, it's a dog dry. It's a drying robe for dogs. So you put it on when the dog is wet and it dries your dog as she wears it. And then it comes with this little mitt and you use that to dry her paws and her tail and her ears because dogs don't like having those bits covered yeah. up. And I see you've got a three-part technology to the robe now that you're going to show us That's here. Right. We've got a demonstration there. I'll, yeah. I'll take so <laughs> Most people, you're going to take it, fantastic. <laughs> so most people will use um, a towel to dry their dog. Yeah. So dog dry is made with three fabrics. So there's an inner layer that wicks the moisture from the dog's body. Then there's a super absorbent layer in the middle. And then outside is, both, is waterproof. So you can see here that a towel has, you know, absorbed um, a little cup of water. And so dog dry is working here away. It takes a couple of minutes. So okay. that'll work away and it'll absorb all the water into the core, okay? But then what happens is nothing comes out the other it's side. It's not even coming through, I was gonna so, say So that, when yeah. the dog lies down and their full body weight is on yeah, it, yeah. it keeps all that mess out of your car and out of your house. Complete. So the dog can move around freely and you don't have to deal with any big Which wet mess. Which is amazing if you want to go out on your beach walks and things, especially yes. coming up to the winter when it's going to be raining yes. like all the time. It's so good. And tell us now, with the idea, was it a light bulb moment for you or was it a well, couple of years of... It talk? was herself, yeah. so yeah. Luna. So she She's a retriever and she's into water. Now, yeah. I mean, literally into water. <laughs> so, like, you go on the beach and she just jumps in. She 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 just loves it and she, she comes alive. And so I needed a way to let her do what she wants to do. 
and also um, to not have extra housework for me. Yeah. There's enough housework in the world. Tell me about <laughs> it. So, and now with um, Leo, they got you involved with a fashion designer. So tell us about your design experience with them. So Leo helped with a feasibility grant first. And through that research, we found that the most important thing for people was the comfort of yeah. their dogs. Dogs needed to be able to move. And you see she's lying down and she's oh, very comfortable. She's comfortable, guys. And so we brought me. in a fashion designer because <laughs> they know how to cut clothes so that you can yeah. move. Yes. And dogs have all these different body shapes. Yeah. And so the, a lot of work went into how do you design it so the dog can be comfortable and move and lie down, etc. So. Absolutely amazing. Well, that's dog joy for you guys. You know where to find it now. Inside to the guys in the warm studio. I'm staying with Luna. <laughs> uh, Thanks very much. Great Kathy. idea. Three brilliant businesses. Yeah, three I would use all three of them. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic. Now, time to, for a short break. But still to come, we're going to chat to the football legend that is Roddy Collins. Plus, darling, Charlotte Tilbury will be in studio to have a chat about makeup for the stars. We we'll it. see you in a few minutes. Time now to take a look at today's paper, starting with the Irish Independent and the headline, read, the headline reads, A Time to Mourn, and it pictures some of the mourners attending the funerals of the first of the ten blast victims laid to rest yesterday in the broken Donegal town. We will walk with you all in your pain. That's the front page of the Daily Mail. The star's poignant headline found in Dad's loving arms. First responders found the youngest victim of the Creasle explosion, Shauna flanagan Garway, in her daddy's arms. Oh, yes. Terrible. Moving on to the Herald now, which goes with fall of the gunman empire. Jonathan Dowdell's shock decision to give evidence against Jerry the Monk Hutch could now lead to other members of the gang facing serious criminal charges over the 2016 Regency Hotel murder. The Mirror goes with Maddie suspect on Irish girl rape rap. The Irish woman allegedly attacked by a German suspect in the Maddie McCann case hopes to finally get justice as the man has been charged with several other sex crimes. The Examiner's main headline reads, Anger at the plan to move Ukraine refugees. Last gasp efforts are being made to avoid more than 135 Ukrainian women and children have to be re relocated from Killarney Hotel to Westport in Mayo today. And finally, the Irish Times, which goes, next year we will feel like a recession. The IMF warns the International Monetary Fund has cut its growth forecast for the global economy for the fourth time this year, blaming the deteriorating outlook on the war in Ukraine, rising inflation and a slowdown in China. Also pictured on the front pages of lots of the newspapers are the girls in green celebrating their World Cup cup qualification last night and well done to them. Absolutely, what a win. Yeah. What, a yeah. what a win. They're really Historic. doing it for the girls, I have to say, and their viewers are so happy with yeah. that. Mm. Brilliant. Got a lovely text in, so incredibly proud of our women's team's performance last night. They deserve the country's praise. I hope they get the same support as the men next summer. I hope they do too. And I think, yeah. they yeah. I think they will. I think they will. I honestly believe this could be an Italia 90 moment yeah. for the women's mm. game and that, you know, the men are going to have to watch on with envy because the Euros draw that they have is going to be so, so oh, difficult. Really but I love this. And I, you just heard Amber Barrett. She's, of course, from Donegal. Spoke and she so well. scored that goal last night. She spoke so well. A quality goal for Amber Barrett last night. And such a class act dedicated to the community of Creasa, who, of course, both her grandparents were there. She knew people yeah. who unfortunately died. She knew some of the members of 10 who died in that. And... Um, yeah, I thought she was such a good spokesperson yes. for it as well. Such an honourable thing to do as yeah. well. So, now, so yeah. great. Moving on to another story. Seagulls. <laughs> seagulls. So this is obviously, this is, uh, the Dublin councillor has called for seagulls to be fed contraceptive pills in a bit, bid to control their numbers. And this, she is, of course, a representative of Hoth, Hoth and Malahide. Yeah, because Hoth is specifically really bad because you have they're, the chippers yeah, along there and people come out yeah. and the seagulls like they swoop down they're not afraid of you they're not afraid they have of all you. the confidence they have more confidence than the half the people in this country yeah. like, I it's know. crazy and they're on Malahide you as well but lots of people are getting in touch with saying the gulls need to go it's them or the people who, are, who feed them <laughs> the idea of throwing out leftover food for the birds is crazy the swarm of gulls that linger in my area it's actually scary and if you leave food out for them of course well, and, and listen, the back. bin system is a problem yeah. with this as well. We always see overloaded bins. I have to read this one. I was really upset during the summer when my family and I were at the zoo. A cute little duckling appeared with Mammy Duck. Out of nowhere, a seagull swooped in and took the baby duckling. No. Look at this. Oh, oh there it is coming no. down. Oh, no. Uh, 
adults were shouting and roaring, which made the seagull drop the duckling before swooping back and taking him again. <gasps> It was so upsetting. I mean, they are not scared. They're honestly, not scared of they're unbelievable. <laughs> they're that is um, terrible. Yeah, so it's frightening now. So do keep those messages coming in as well about yeah. both. Send your best wishes to the girls in green and also to the seagulls too. Now, coming up next, we're at the outspoken pundit Roddy Collins on his phenomenal football journey and career highlights. That's coming up after the break. Welcome back. He's the outspoken football legend turned pundit and now Roddy Collins opens up about his incredible career in his autobiography, The Rod Father. What a book it is. The Rod Father, welcome to the show. <laughs> the Rod Father, yeah. <laughs> that was Sinead, my daughter, she picked that one out, yeah. I love the that. Rod Father. I hope she got credit in this book. Ah, yeah, sure. I'm the Rod Father here, but back in the house, I'm just the, the yeah. dishwasher. And know? I know exactly what that's like for the daughter in the house as well. <laughs> Speaking of daughter, we have to ask about the result last night for the Irish women. Brilliant. How amazing and how much of a landmark is this? It was brilliant, Tommy. Well, obviously, it's a landmark, right? But for ladies' football, it's fantastic. But it shows you that with the right coaching, yeah. game plan, substitution, game management, they can overcome obstacles because Scotland were a better team last night. Mm -hmm. But the result is brilliant. And to see the euphoria and the excitement in the manager, it was just brilliant. And I said Sinead, the rod father, yeah. she named it. Her daughter, Fia, is making a name for herself in football. So right. it'd be a great inspiration for her and all, all the little girls. Are there. It's brilliant. It's a great lift for the country. Absolutely, Brilliant. yeah. And then in your autobiography, The Rod Father, you said your ghost writer is Paul Herod. How was it working with oh, him? Oh, come here, Paul. With him. <laughs> now, you said autobiography. I say it's stories of my life. Yeah. Because yeah. half them couldn't be put on paper. Oh. So we call it the half Well, you got the right man there, uh, Paul, well, to do it for you. I know Paul a long time, right? And uh, I've been asked a few times, Tommy, I've been asked, you know, would yeah. you write a book? I wouldn't be bothered, blah, blah, blah. And then Karen said to me, Paul would be a great man to do it. Just mm. out of the blue. Yeah. Then I got a phone call, Paul, and he came to the house every Friday and we had scones and coffee, which we don't eat scones, I was putting weight on. <laughs> and we told, myself and, myself and Paul would talk for an hour before we'd write anything. And he, he, he throws shapes when he's telling stories, and I do. So two was in the middle of the kitchen floor, throwing shapes, telling stories. And Karen would say, you know, I started writing this book. Come on. It was brilliant. It was almost like a therapy session, I'd say. Well, it was. No, no, it was. Yeah, Actually, yeah. it was. It was in many ways for going, digging back up. Like, in your life, you go from there to there. But when you put it into blocks and the hardships and the, and the, and the happy times, it can be... It, it's, oh, it's unbelievable. I'd say it's amazing looking back on that. But if you think about your career, I think you've played for 16 different teams. You managed Tommy, ever keep over 10. That, you know? But then, but the, like... But they must have wanted me, but, Tom. You but know? you come for... Well, they did obviously want you as well, but you come from such a sporting family. Your brother Steve as well. Yeah. Collins, boxer, beat Chris Eubank. I mean, yeah. such a landmark occasion that was. Did you start in boxing and then go into football? Oh, like, yeah. how did, how did the, you kind of both go two different paths? Well, I'll tell you. Right. My whole family on my father's side, pure boxing. Are they? Right. My mother's brother was the heavyweight champ, Jack O'Rourke. So she kept a boxing family as well. Ah, right? right. We had a gym on the back of our house. Everyone else got an extension with a boxing gym. Right? <laughs> but I just seen George Best one day. It was 1968. And we seen him and I loved it. Mm. The glamour. And I used to go boxing. And as I tell people, you go into school for a kip, put your hand to your face on the desk and the pain. Congeal blood up your nose now. There's no. George Best, no. the greatest oh of all time. Yeah, and so, I got the privilege to, to spend time with him at Fulham. Did you? So, yeah, I did, Jan. He was a lovely, lovely fella. Shy, yeah. but very helpful yeah. to the younger players. So, football, I mean, it was more glamour, four coats and, you know, jags and stuff like that. Boxing was like dingy old jeans and broken noses and... You it's know, a, so. bit, a bit of you. I can see you now with your suit. You're, you're, you're the glamour. You've got the glamour side I of it love as well. It. I got yeah. that me down uh, Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my dad, dad dressed well. Oh, Yeah, wow. we buried me down a beautiful Italian suit. Oh, So wow. I, loved, I loved a bit of clever. From when I was a kid, Mitch and I was school. Yeah. Hate school. Hate, never went to school. I used to go down and watch Louis Copeland, senior, stand okay. at his door with a tape, and I said, I wonder could I ever afford a suit yeah. in there one day. Yeah. So and it, so, because you went to England at 16, but it took a, a while before you managed to get signed for a professional team. Yeah, I was a late developer. I went at 16 and I broke my leg at 18. OK. Wow. And I had three years making a comeback. So I wrote to all the clubs, I got a forged birth certificate. So you forged a I birth forged certificate? It, yeah. 
How did you get away with that? Well, it's simple. I got someone to do it for me. <laughs> and it was very authentic. And I sent it away and I got a contract for two and a half years on the back of being 23 instead of 25. Wow. So that well, but it went against me in the end because when I went to get my pension at 35, they said, you're only 33. I said, oh, no, no, I'm not. So we were having that because I had to wait on that one. And also, in Wikipedia, right, I'm 60. OK. And I'm worth six million. All right. So I'm looking for the six million. I don't know where the 60 came from. I tell you, anybody can write anything on Wikipedia. And did, did Mansfield ever catch you out on that? Never. Never? Never. So I'm still 60. I mean, you look at Wikipedia, I'm 60. So people go, oh, and say, wait, wait, what, what do you want me to be 60? Do you, you do what you have to do. Do you look back with any regrets, particularly around that football career? Yeah, and I've highlighted in the book, I was picked for the Irish youth team and I thought I was in the team. I don't know how it goes in rugby, but you're in the, yeah, all yeah. the planning the day like, before. Yeah. And then the day the, the game, I wasn't picked. And Johnny, Johnny Giles was the manager. And me being me, I said, ah, home that. And I walked out of the hotel and went home. You oh, did wow. not. Yeah, I did, yeah. And did you ever think now, obviously disagreeing with your manager back then, and now you became a manager after that, like what had appealed to you after, you know, had, having all those disagreements? I learned how to drop players properly. Uh, OK. And how you do it. Yeah. You tell them all the brilliant things they're going to, everything. And then you say, I'm going to start you on the bench today. And they walk out of the office thinking, that's great. And then they realise they're, they're dropped. <laughs> so I learned, yeah, you learned. You almost taught but, yourself a lesson then with that, didn't you? Ah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, look, if you don't learn lessons along the way, and all the clubs are played for, and then I learned a lot from Torno O'Connor. He was the man that really inspired me as a manager. He had a great way with, about him. And I learned a lot from him, and I learned how to kick people up the backside as well. So it's 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 a big mishmash of, you know, qualities and a making big, contributions to, to motivating people and tactically. And that, you know. a big part of the book is about your dad as well uh, as yeah. an inspiration. Yeah. There's a bit in the book that you talk about being on the bus. Yeah. And you see him, and it's pouring rain, and he's travelled over, and you're only yeah. a young fella there on your own. I was 16, Tommy. I was a man, really. You were a man at 15 back then, because you left school at 15. But my dad, me, me, honestly, I can't explain it. And I get very emotional, like, but he was, he was just the most iconic figure of my life. Mm. And, look, he didn't have a lot. He was a good, good job in Guinness, but to be away in London, to be homesick, and only to stick it out, to buy me... I wanted to buy me dad, Jack. Right. That, I didn't care about me being a... I wanted to buy him a Jag, because he loved Mike Baldwin on one of the tellies, uh, Coronation Street. Yeah. Yeah. And he loved his Jag, right? Yeah. And I remember being homesick and wishing I was home, and there was a bucket down one day, fork lightning, and I'm on the bus coming back from... We played Watford, and I looked out, and there's me dad, with his little hold on back the rain, beating down on him. And I, honestly, it was like... It was like seeing God, you know, it was brilliant. Was Special brilliant. memory. Yeah. Uh, come here, don't be talking. Yeah. I know, well, family must mean so much to you. We know, like, your wife, Caroline, is your childhood sweetheart. She's the boss. And you've heard you never go to bed with an argument. I love that. Yeah. I have to ask you, though, when you were caught out drinking with Vinnie Jones all night, <laughs> how did that go down in Which the house? Which time are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> caught that many times. <laughs> Look, I got, I got sorted out. <laughs> I got sorted out, let's just say, I got sorted out. We marched on and it became less frequent as I got older. Yeah. When I was younger, I remember one day, Vinnie rang me, I jumped on a flight, I'm on the lash. Carla's brother rings me, Rod, are you serious? I said, what's wrong? Carla's looking everywhere for you. I said, I'll be back tonight, there's a party in Moyles in Dublin. He says, you're up on BBC racing there in Newbury, but Newbury, I think it was called, Newbury races, <laughs> me and Vinnie, drinking <laughs> the champagne at the, front, the, the, the finish line. So we done the mad stuff, but Vinny was brilliant, you know. And Tanya and, God rest her soul, Tanya and Carolyn became great friends. And I went on the last with Sean Edwards many a time. Oh, really? Oh, he's Sean. a dangerous man. <laughs> Sean is one of the most genuine, honest friends and Vinny that I could ever hope to meet in my life. I'm yeah. godfather of her. I done it with, um, what's your name, fella, you know, in Playboy England. Which one? Andy uh, he, Farrell? No, 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 he was dropped. He was always oh, in the... He, was, he went with Kelly Brook and all. Oh, Cipriani. Cipri Danny and Tony. Cipriani. Oh, and, really? And, yeah, and the Wales fitness coach. I joined Godfathers to, really? to Sean's latest. Yeah, oh, little, yeah. Little, little, uh, little, Sean, he's a lovely fella. He's Listen, the best. Roddy, before we go, I have to ask you, with the women's success last night, you're a football pundit now. Yeah. And the men's nightmare group for the Euros. Well, like, what, do we what way do you see it? Well, look, I think... They're going to get a free hit with, with Holland and Germany. Or, sorry, no, Holland France. and France. Because 
we do well against the teams yeah. like Portugal and Belgium. The underdog. It's the one where you come up in Gibraltar or the Greece games. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They'll be the telling ones. Because if, if you don't get the right result against France or Holland, people make excuses. Yeah. But I would analyse it at the end on, like, like the game last night, substitutions, game plan, tactical awareness. That's all about football. It's not about just putting players, motivating them and getting everyone to like it. Mm. So there we know. We need Vera Pau in and charge ah, of the men brilliant. as well. She's, she is absolutely fantastic. Yeah, Listen, uh, Roddy, your book is out. The Rod Father is available in all good bookshops at the minute. And I tell you what, we're only scratching the surface with some of the stories. And thank you so much. Thanks, Tom. Thank you Thanks so very much, much, Roddy. Great thank to have you. you with us. <laughs> now, it's almost time for a break. But in the kitchen next, we're going to be having a smoky stew from the America's Deep South. Oh, wow. Plus, we teach you how to style suits on the catwalk back after this very short break. Inspired by nature, powered by light. Beko Harvest Fresh sponsors cookery on Ireland AM. With the cold weather creeping in, we have got the perfect dish to warm you up. I love this type of thing. Oh, the, the smell yeah. of it. As Jack well. O'Keefe is here with a gumbo stew. I love an old stew. I don't even know a gumbo stew I don't know what a gumbo is, stew it's, a, it's, it's like New Orleans type gumbo? Yeah, it's deep south Louisiana. Yeah. New Orleans. The different parts of the deep south have different versions of it. It's pretty much the same what we call an Irish stew. Oh. You know, traditionally, it's supposed to be lamb. But like yeah. Everything ends up inside it. I put <laughs> mince into my stew. You monster. You? Yeah. yeah. Oh, lamb. Oh, I love no, an I Irish stew. I do a yeah. mince stew. But, and, I love, and I actually make a nice mince stew. But the, the big go. difference, because like, even when I was like, I was on the phone to Mam last night, she said, what are you doing making that for? You won't be able to pronounce that. <laughs> like that. Does your mother speak like that? Yeah. The phone's going to be ringing now. Yeah, I was going to say, what's are your you mother's name? Yes, ma'am, it's live. What's your mother's name? <laughs> Anne-Marie. Anne-Marie, good morning, Anne-Marie. You taught him well, Anne-Marie. You taught him well. <laughs> Louisiana, look, The difference between a gumbo and an Irish stew is, it's this technique I'm about to show you now, and it's called a roux. Right? We make room, we're making a bechamel for a lasagna oh, yeah. or a milk yeah. cheese sauce, and we use butter and flour. Equal quantities of butter and flour. In the deep south, they use oil and flour. So oh, that the oil yeah. can go up to a much higher heat, and you can get the flour to this lovely peanut buttery colour. Uh, color. And that's what you're smelling right now, is that kind of toasted flour smell. In here... Sorry, so what sort of oil is that? Just some flour oil. Normal uh, sunflower oil. With flour? And plain flour, straight into the hot oil. OK, right. So I have the pot at medium heat. Right, before you do this at home, have everything else chopped, ready to go, and stand here with the pot of medium heat and a whisk and keep whisking. Because that will immediately take action. And if you turn away to do it's, something yeah, else, it's, it's to going to burn. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, right. And you might as well just throw away the pot, right? You can see the way it's bubbling away, tipping away. Gradually, it will change colour over the next six to seven minutes, right? Okay. But because of the beauty of live TV... And becomes TV, that what you have there. Exactly. Now, the reason this has a few bits and lumps inside it is I browned off the chicken first inside it. Oh, OK, so there's the taste in that. Exactly. Right, so, and I used the kind of fat from the chicken as well to, when I added in the flour, so it's all more flavour, right? Now, that's on a nice medium heat. I'm going to pop in what in the Deep South they call the Trinity. So in French cooking, we have mirepoix, in Italian, we have sofrito. But in the Deep South, they have the Trinity. That's bell pepper, celery and onion. And they go... Celery? Celery. Celery seems an odd one, doesn't it? But celery is so sweet, and it's such an essential part of classical dining and French cooking. It's a necessary ingredient. It's one of those ones where if the recipe says celery, go get it. OK, really, oh. yeah. Yeah, right. I'm not a big fan of celery I'm not a big fan either, of celery, no. If it's in a and stew, you know what? I, I can't nice. stand it raw, yeah. but I love it cooked. Because they always say, like, actually, you lose more calories eating celery than you do when you're eating it, because there's, like, no calories in it, but you're actually oh, right. chewing. What's the veggies go in? Oh, right. Mix them <laughs> into the roux like that. <laughs> Whatever. Whatever, Tommy, yeah. <laughs> OK, so you kind of like... And you're just sautéing them off in the roux, just like you would if you were making a, a kind of a milk-based tick sauce at home, like your white sauce you pour So you're not adding bacon. anything to this now? No, just season it with salt. Give that about two or three minutes just to soften out the veg and bring out some of its flavours. In with about six cloves of crushed garlic. Oh, my God. Yeah, six tons cloves. of the stuff, right? And again, give that about two or three minutes. Now, look at the bottom of the pot. Everything is oh, stuck to it. stuck, yeah. Beer. Beer. Nice can of whatever artisan beer you can find, or cider, or white wine, and pop it in. Once it goes in and comes up to a boil, now we can turn the heat up and start using your whisk just to scrape the bottom of the pan and get all that lovely flavour okay, into yeah. liquid. Right? Very Bring good. it to the boil. Once it comes to the boil, the alcohol is gone. Gee, the smell of that is yeah. beautiful, isn't it? And what's, what's in this, your sample here? My sample? <laughs> <laughs> Beef stock. Provided that this morning. <laughs> 
So this is just your jelly stockpot you get in the supermarket. I <laughs> know, oh, let's focus. You yeah, some more, more time. Need some more this water, is Jack. <laughs> <laughs> He's very dehydrated. <laughs> you have the magic dipper there, Tommy, do you? <laughs> Whatever you're eating, it's wrong for you. OK, right. <laughs> right. Jelly stockpot. Pop jelly in with some boiling pot. water. Yeah, you know oh, what yeah, you get in the, the supermarket. Pots, yeah. Look at the way that's thickened up already into a sauce, right? Put in your beef stock or your chicken stock or your vegetable stock, whatever you want. If you want to make a seafood gumbo, use fish stock, right? Oh, okay. Again, bring it back up to the simmer. Take the pre-browned off chicken ties. I always use chicken ties. They're cheaper, oh, yeah, especially cheap. with everything that's going on at the moment. Hey, They're much cheaper. Boneless They're ones. Boneless. Yeah. Of course, okay. you can use. Yeah. You can use bone on. Ah, yeah. And then I have some Polish smoked sausage. That I just picked up in the supermarket last night. All oh, right, po because it's What's the Polish. Po well, because I would have thought like chorizo or something. Chorizo no, would do the job perfectly fine, but this one's very similar to the actual proper sausage that you're supposed to use oh, in a that gumbo. That they would have down in. And it has the flavour. It's so garlicky. There's fennel in it. It's smoky. Oh, it's amazing, right? Now, Pop how long all that does that in. go in? How long do you then simmer that for? I simmer that on a medium to low heat for about two and a half hours last night. Oh, oh really? One hour is perfectly fine, okay, but just yeah. like everything. Low and slow, the best way and possible. And then the chicken just fall off. Or if you have a busy lifestyle, pour it into your soup cooker yeah. after you go to work. Yeah. Yeah, and can you put it in the oven? You can put it in the oven at about 120, 130 as well if you want and leave it in there for about two or three I hours. I kind of think of uh, the deep south as well. It's always low and slow, isn't it? Like yeah, you look, think of brisk, you think a lot all easier. that sort of stuff. It's very slow cooked. Bringing out those real flavour. flavours. Yeah. I'm just going to, like a tea bag into your cup of tea, I'm just going to add some flavour into this. Some fresh sage and a sprig of rosemary from the garden. Okay. If you have like it. That. And dried if you have it. What if dried you, is you fine know, as well. Okay. You know yourself with American cooking, it's yeah. always dry, right? Come on, but Now, the one I prepared really, earlier, yeah. look at this. Look at the chicken. Look at it. It's just falling apart. There's a lot of juice in it, though, isn't oh, it? Yes. How, are you going to, how are you going to get this out of there? That's why I have a cup. Because guess what Jack forgot this morning? Oh, the ladle. The ladle. the ladle. Right? So a nice cup of gumbo with some brown rice. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's a winter warmer right there, isn't it? That oh. is... Oh, yeah. We're Look, and all that. that lovely fat, perfect for this time of the year. You could add pumpkin into it if you've loads all of pumpkins right. left over from Halloween. And then some chopped chives I just love to make that it fancy. Now. I love that. Yeah. Uh, forget about the chopped chives, just oh. give us a... <laughs> Jack. Yeah. Oh, yes. Boys, enjoy oh. that. Get that into you now. Oh, with the right nice the more it's Just that put hair on your chest. Yeah, yeah. Oh, the smell of it, though. It's yeah. actually the sausage, I think, is that you can smell the most. Really good. What do you reckon, Al? Garlicky, there's a nice little kick of heat off it. Good God, there's a real kick <clears> off it. Yeah, I may have oh. put a chilli into that one oh, as well. Oh, that's okay. Oh, mm. Yummy. It's lovely. And you can finish off a little dash of Tabasco as well if you want even more of barbecue. a kind of a warm. No, you wouldn't. Barbecue you wouldn't, seriously. That's the sausage coming um, out now. Yeah, Jack O'Keefe, as always. That's Thank delicious. you so much. It's Pleasure. absolutely gorgeous. It's real, though. Mm. If it's raining outside and you just want to be in cold, like, <laughs> make a warm. fort yeah. on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> Jack, thank you. Now, coming up, we're styling power suits on the catwalk. Join us in a few. Inspired by nature, powered by light. Beko Harvest Fresh sponsors cookery on Ireland AM. Welcome back. It's all about power dressing on today's catwalk. It certainly is. And Mandy Murray showing us how to style this season's must-have suits. Good morning Good to morning, Mandy. Alec. So Good it's all about the suit. And you're looking very <laughs> suited and booted oh, this morning. Like the 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 you gave me enough lift the last time I was <laughs> on this. And I better stick with the program of what I'm yeah. supposed to be showing this theme, morning. Stick with the theme, Mandy. Stick with the theme. <laughs> so the memo came out very early. <laughs> so it's all about power dressing. We are going to see an absolutely humongous amount of trouser suits or blazers and trousers. That's what's going to be. It's massive coming. We were chatting about this before we came Girls on Girls love a suit. Absolutely. Yeah. I think they're sharp, they're elegant, they always work well, whether it's work or indeed going out at night. We've got Pam, Pam here. here, yeah. We've got Pam and we're showcasing this morning for Nicola Ross, Nicola Ross Boutique in Nace and Kildare and they're also available online. Now, what we decided to do is add a little bit of oomph on this particular look and we went with the coat first of all. I'm a big fan of coats and good investment on coats and this is one of them. Works really, really well. It's in the royal blue as we see here. They have them in a variety of colours. I love it because as well like that, it's very smart, it's elegant, but it's also light, which I'll always say when I'm showcasing coats, I love a light coat. And invest in a good coat because you will get years out of it. Of course you will. I have a John Rocha coat that I bought about 
15 years ago. And you still bring and it over. Yeah, and it still, and it still looks well. And it looks yeah. lovely, yeah. yeah. Lovely, that's it. I love that. And I'm loving it too, and it's really, really nice. Now, underneath, we teamed it up with probably more of a work suit, really. This probably looks like in this beautiful navy suit with this blazer, first of all. And again, what's clever about trouser suits is they will go with an absolute multitude of things that you already have in your wardrobe. Mm. So always think mix and match when you're buying. I think it's always a must because it's easy to be able to pop this on with something else. And even the navy and the blue go so well together. Don't they, Cathy? Really? Yeah, I'm loving it as well. It works really, really well. Tapered so these trousers. are sold separately, but you obviously you can buy it as the suit, but the, they are sold separately. They are sold separately, Alan, yeah, which is also a great way if you didn't want the full look. But personally, of course, I would go the full look. I think it looks well. Now, we teamed it up then with this beautiful blouse. As we said, it's the mixed print on the blouse between the navy and the royal blue, and it brings in a little bit of colour. Because sometimes, particularly if you're wearing something like this for work, sometimes people are kind of keeping it a bit too safe. I think by adding a bit of colour, it just adds a little bit of... I think it looks a little bit more stylish. Absolutely. Lovely. And we have Anna next now. So with Anna next, and I'm loving this. So we were going on about the colour oh, on this area. No, it's no. fabulous. I love it as well. And staying with Nicola Ross, of course, online as well. But again, this is the actual orange version of the previous coat we showed that was in the royal blue. Oh, really? It looks totally different. Doesn't it? Does. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like different. even in the shape looks different yeah, for some reason. Yeah, it's And it's, it's in, and it's actually, the shape-wise element you just mentioned there is actually for all about the oversizing. It's yeah. very much oversizing this year. Again, like that, I think a coat like this sure goes with absolutely everything. But love the orange. Mm. We've seen quite a lot of orange last season coming through again. It's oh, nice yes. to carry a pop of colour through the yeah. winter as well instead of going dark. Full on, yeah. black, brown. Yeah, yeah, it's really absolutely. nice, especially with the jeans. The jeans are lovely. And the, yeah, the jeans are great. The jeans are a fabulous fit. Of course, we see here with the blazer itself, it is in the orange as well, which may not look orange. It actually might look like more of a red, but it actually is an orange blazer. And again, we then just teamed up them with this lovely white blouse underneath them. That's a lovely work outfit as well. Isn't it? Mm. Yeah. I feel powerful going to work in that. I yeah, you're kind say. of making the statement yeah, coming in. Yeah. I agree. I think that's why I said there's always something about a power suit. It always just looks really well. So the well. blouse is nice because it doesn't have a collar. It's sort of just the way it's shaped. Exactly. And as you see then, just with a V-neck, which is quite flattering as well. It has a long sleeve. It has the cuff on the sleeve um, as well. And tell us about the jeans. And then the jeans then, as you see, the trousers then themselves, they're tapered trousers, very fitted, high-waisted, and as you see then, just at the base of those, there's a little slit then just down at the end on those. But again, like that, a lovely work trousers, but you could easily again wear these out at night time and rechange the top to something else on the top half if you wanted to. Yeah, a day-to-night nice. look almost. Yeah, yeah. It, which is always clever. Yeah. yeah. You know, a lot of people go from work out, out at night time as well. Dervla. Here's Dervla. Here's Dervla. is rock, rocking it this time for Oxendales, and it's Oxendales. I am delighted to showcase them this morning. But I'm loving this. This is what they call a misty blue suit. Misty blue. Misty blue. This is what the colour is all about. I'm loving it. I think it's really smart. As you can see here, it has got all the gold buttons going down the front, double and um, double breasted, but we kept it open this morning. You can close, obviously, optional. But it's smart, isn't it? I love yeah. the colour. I love the gold accents on it. It's gorgeous. Yeah, it's really I'm loving this as well. And as I said, it's easy to be able, I think this would actually be fabulous with a pair with a white shirt as well and a pair of jeans. Just for something a little bit but different. But that blouse is very relaxed and very nice underneath. Isn't it gorgeous? It, yeah. And it's actually fabulous. So underneath it then we've teamed up with this beautiful blouse. And again, like that, it has the shoulder statement as you can see here. This is absolutely a fabulous top. Now today we actually styled it inside the trousers, but it actually has a slight peplum on the base of that oh, top okay. inside. So you could easily wear it outside of an outfit. And a nice shoulder detail shoulders, on yeah. it, yeah. It's it beautiful. I just think, again, like that, it's not overpowering, but yet quite smart and elegant. It has the little shades, as you see, of silver, and again, that misty blue going on in the top as well. And once again, you can buy them separately. Indeed you can, you could absolutely buy them separately. And then we just teamed up them with these matching trousers, pocket detail, has the belt. Did you add the belt or is I, the belt? I actually, I actually did add the belt to it, yeah. Okay. I just felt it needed the belt for something yeah. a little bit just to and bring the bag? it all together. And then the oversized bag, pop your laptop in and away you go. And you are going to look the business when you're I walking know. into the Looks like she's about to close the deal. Yeah. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm loving it. And it's all from Oxendales as well. And it's lovely because they're bringing out a lot of new ranges online at the minute in regard to bringing out for younger people as well, which is brilliant. So yeah. it is for all ages too. Yeah. Yeah. And for men as well. And for men, of course, Ellen, yeah. as well. They've great men. Got Pam indeed. again. Wow, this colour. Yeah, this is gorgeous. And this as well is from Oxendales.ie. Isn't it fabulous? Yeah, yeah there's something about suit. a red trouser suit, isn't there? You'll I know. stop and look. That's the thing with the I'm colour. not going to say the word, but it's very yeah, coming it up is. to an event <laughs> yeah. we on know December exactly 25th. But I'm not going to say it. It's too early. <laughs> Fair enough. I won't say it either. So, but we all know what you're thinking, and it definitely does rock. I think 
The, the color of the shade is stunning on this. And it's again like that, and you said it, Cassia, it makes a statement. Any lady that will walk into a room with a suit like this is going to say, wow, this is beautiful, mm. you know? And again, like that, it is, as you see, with the button detail down the front. We teamed it up today then with underneath with a beautiful blouse. And of course, as the well. wide leg trouser here. Yeah, so it's different. Some people are a bit afraid to go with the wide leg trousers. Wide leg trousers are very much I like on them. trend. Especially I Especially if you want to wear like them with sneakers, they look quite flattering on Absolutely. you. Absolutely. Yeah. And you said that you could easily pop these trousers yeah. on a pair of sneakers in a different top if you want to. But again, like that, as I said, with the polka dot top, I think it worked really well on yeah, that. Yeah, it really jacket. does. Yeah, so it works. It's a lovely it's, top. It's with nice, it. isn't it? I love it as well. And again, like that, you could obviously wear it with black or whatever, a pair of black jeans. Or black skirt with that then, Absolutely. yeah. Black and there's a, skirt, a, a wide waistband with the trousers, which I like. I know a lot of women will appreciate that. It looks very comfortable. Absolutely, yeah. it is, yeah. yeah. And I'm, I'm, this look, I just think it's fabulous. We just paired it off there with this beautiful little clutch bag then to bring the whole look together. For a nighttime look, for that C word we're not allowed to mention. Yeah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Mandy. Thank you. Lovely Thank looks you. this morning. Thank, Thank, you. Thank, you, Thank you so, so much. much. Thank, Thank you for you. that. Thank well, you. in the final era, we've got beauty boss Charlotte Tilbury, which she shares her makeup wisdom with us. I'm and so there's a lot of wisdom with Charlotte Tilbury. <laughs> there really is. Plus the new detective novel inspired by a real-life Garda hero. We're going to see you after the break. very welcome back. We've been talking a lot and there's been a huge amount of messages coming in from the Dublin councillor who has asked that seagulls be given contraceptive pills to yes, stem. You are That's hearing this true. right if you're just tuned in. But <laughs> now I have to just say though as well, the DSPCA don't agree with this no. and their spokesperson, Gillian Bird, <laughs> bum, bum. thinks that uh, there are ethical prob prob problems with this. But um, what, what do we reckon? See, so I know many that they're texts. a problem. They are a problem, but I just do think it's a little bit unethical, the birth control thing. But what can but we do? But if it keeps it down, it's better than culling them. And, you know, True. our estate is full of seagulls beca because our neighbours keep feeding them. They get fed at the same time every day and they just, they wait for it, sit on the rooftops and there's always a plate of leftovers and sliced pans left in the middle of the road. It's ridiculous. <laughs> of course, if that's going to be left in the middle of the road, the seagulls are yeah, going to be there. Oh, yeah. I have a funny one now with birth control. All ads, feeding the seagulls a contraceptive pill isn't the answer. Sure, how will they be able to remember it with no alarm? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, every day, I was out in Hoth getting an ice cream with my grandson when suddenly I got a clatter in the head. I turned and was faced by the biggest seagull flapping just inches away from my face, yeah. as if his right hook wasn't bad enough. He then took a bite out of my ice cream. They do. Honestly, yeah, they, they, do. they are fearless. They're cheeky. Um, Scream so loud, was traumatised by it. And you do get traumatised by it. I imagine. Like, I, they're so big when they swoop down on you. They're you muscly. can't enjoy your time in the park. You can't have a picnic in peace. Well, I gather that's what people say. People yeah. are now saying around Hoth and around yeah. the coast that they actually around can't Malahide, yeah. have chips and food out <laughs> while walking on the footpath. Now, wait here. here's another story. It's in the Daily Star this morning. So stay-at-home parents yeah. picking up the kids, doing the washing, doing the cooking, doing everything. Thing. They're saying now they've done a study on it that stay-at-home parents should would be the equivalent. The work that they do would be a fifty-three thousand euro salary. There what do you reckon? I think. Well, I think. Uh, and rightly so. So yeah, more than yeah. eight in ten people believe that the role of the stay-at-home parent is either under-supported or undervalued in Ireland. I think both. Do you think so? Yeah, I mean... But my thing is with this is well, who's going to pay it? it? Oh, no, it's not going to be paid. But I mean, because, like, at the end of the day, it may be a choice that you want to stay at home mm -hmm. with your children and stuff like that, but Just maybe... Just be appreciated maybe, yeah. more, Oh, appreciated yeah. more by what? Your husband? Your partner? I guess society... My they wife like, believes yeah. in this 100 yeah. percent because I come um, home and uh, maybe she might be might not be working that day and she goes the amount of work I've, I've done, done today, today. And you've just waltzed in from that TV show <laughs> and done nothing but eat food and talk rubbish. She's not wrong. She's dead right. Yeah. And, <laughs> she's dead and, right. and that's just an, an average morning for you, Tommy. <laughs> now, up next, she's the face and name behind one of the world's biggest makeup brands. Charlotte Tilbury joins us after the break. Our next guest is beauty boss dominating the makeup scene for the last decade. Now, she's dolled up many a diva and her campaigns regularly feature the hottest celebs. 
Charlotte Tilbury. It's lovely oh, to welcome darling. you. Thank you so Sorry, much for like, having I, you back. I know, I was saying the last time we spoke was on Skype, so it's lovely to have you back into oh, the no, studio. I know, it's so lovely to be back in the studio. Oh, Although this call time, darling, I quite like the oh, Skype. I didn't have to get up so early. Oh, what can I say? You smell amazing, by the way. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <laughs> Charlotte, you are literally a household name now. Oh, thank you. In, in the makeup beauty industry. Where did it all start for you? I mean, I've been doing this now for 30 years, but I mean, it just, I, you know, every red carpet around the world, I mean, it all just started really um, uh, through me kind of knowing, assisting Mary Greenwell and then sort of, you know, going on and kind of assisting, uh, you know, and then becoming a makeup artist to all the biggest shows in the world, London, Paris, New York, Milan, the Oscars, red carpets, creating products for some of the biggest luxury houses in the world and then eventually creating my own brand. So I've kind of, I have, you know, I mean, I created Tom Ford's line of makeup, I created so oh, many wow. other lines of makeup, but really now it's the Charlotte Tilbury line, which has, you know, been blowing up really around it's the world. It's taking over huge. the world. And like, it it is, yes, 30 it's, year career, it's you very mentioned. exciting, very exciting. It's so exciting, well, you, you, 30 year career, makeup to the stars and now an incredible brand in such a saturated market as well what would you say your keys to success were i think you know determination hard work i mean a lot of hard work <laughs> still working incredibly hard i'm very passionate about what i do and i love innovating and disrupting coming up with new categories like you know i've created new categories where people like you know hollywood flawless filter like a product that people are like instagrams for the face i'm like no no darling you need a product we can do that we can do that in a product so they've kind of big, i've created new categories that have blown up around the world and then celebrities have fallen in love with them they've gone mad on tiktok they've gone viral mm. you know whether it's kind of setting sprays or whatever it is that i do with people like going to the bath going it works this hairbrush setting spray works i'm in the rain it works my makeup doesn't budget makeup doesn't move so you know they kind of i really i have amazing scientists that I work with. I dream up these incredible ideas of what could be possible. Sometimes it takes 20 years to happen and then we come up with this amazing innovation. But I have to say the quality of my formulas, the reason this brand has done incredibly well is not only was I the world's number one makeup artist, but also, you know, and really kind of got my medals for that. You know, won countless awards around the world for being the world's number one makeup artist. But also just the, the you know, dreaming up these ideas and new categories, innovation for people going, you know what? You're going to look as good as you do on Instagram. I'm going to get a filter that's going to smooth, blur, airbrush your face. I'm going to give you airbrush skin. I'm going to do this for you. And then we come up with these incredible products and then they just go viral around the world. So really, at the end of the day, it's as much as it's my... And I'm always thinking about, I want to democratise makeup. I want everyone to feel and look as beautiful as all my clients on the red carpet. You know, I think... And when people say to me, I can't look as gorgeous as Kate Moss and Mark Cooney, Jennifer Aniston, whoever I'm working with. Yes, you can. Yeah. I just, yeah. I, you know, get the kind of, you know, I can give you a golden goddess look. <laughs> I <laughs> get it, get it you, done. darling. I mean, you were mentioning TikTok and Instagram yeah. and stuff there. I mean, and that has changed the face yeah. of makeup and the beauty yeah. industry because so many people have come through on that now. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. then so has it changed some th in those 30 years so much? It has, I mean, it has, but, you know, I have to say it's wonderful in a way because you get to kind of speak directly to your consumer. It's direct to consumer. You're kind of, yeah. you get amazing feedback. They can, you know, you're not only relying on media, you have their own media. So it's wonderful. It's just lots of different media platforms that you I'd can... love to know now, because you said you, you saw a video of a girl dipping her head in and back in. She's like, I'm still so flawless. So yes. with all of these trends going on, which one is your favourite? And is there any beauty hacks you don't disagree with or really do agree with? I mean, do you know what? Uh, my thing is let everyone do whatever they want. They, they, obviously, uh, there are some... I mean, actually, sometimes I get some of my best ideas, actually, looking at Instagram and TikTok thinking, oh, that's very complicated, what they're doing there. <laughs> I'm like, oh, no, maybe not. Let me just come up with a product for, for them to help them. And that's, you know, honestly how I've come up with my, some of my biggest selling products, whether it's Beauty Light ones or whether it's different, different ones that have just, you know, my contour ones, it, they've just gone mad. Cause I've been looking at Instagram going... That girl looks like she's had a fight with a mud truck or she's literally having to do 50 million things to contour her face. And I'm like, oh, no, 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 no. Let me just come up with one simple, easy product. And then you come up with this product, you know, contour wand, whatever, and it just goes and then it goes viral because it's quick and easy. They can, you can just go, right, I'm going to show you what I do on a kind of Jennifer Lopez, yeah. how to contour. Yeah. But I'm always thinking about the, the, con the you know, my clients. The consumer, yeah. So then my consumer to say, how are we going to just go, right, I'm going to give you the <clears throat> Jennifer Lopez kind of contour and we're going to put it on, we're going to go one, two, three, done. 
blend. Yeah. You know, and it's going to be, it's going to have a tube and it's going to have a sponge and we're going to just chum, 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 chum like that really quickly. And so those things are sometimes by me watching people and then going to the lab going, can we make it easier? We've got to help Let's these people, darling. We've got to help yeah. them. I mean, so, and people obviously respond to that as well because yes. you wouldn't be uh, the number one makeup artist in the world. I thought you said that. <laughs> <laughs> No. No, I listen, I've got the medals. That I've got the medals. Your latest yeah. campaign, of course, Kate yeah. Moss, Lily James, Twiggy. I mean, yes. you get Iconic. these people involved. Iconic names. Yes, yes. So iconic. And you know, I am so lucky. I, you know, I have worked with some of the most incredibly inspiring, amazing women around the world. Um, and then my friends. I mean, Kate Moss has been my friend since I was nine. You know, nineteen. We sort of became really kind of best friends, and she's mm. got mother to my kids. And and it's just so fun. I and mean, it's just so fun to work with her. She's so brilliant. You know, incredibly stylish, and she looks amazing in the new campaign. I mean, she just you know was inspired by Studio Fifty Four and and all those girls. And Lily James, I've known for a long time. Again. You know, you work with these girls on the red carpets and, you know, on fashion shows and shoots and whatever. And they genuinely, you know, you go, they, you know, sometimes they're selling their products, their products, you know, my products to me. I'm like, they're like, I can't go anywhere without the blah, blah, blah. You know, I'm like, OK, come on, let's go and have a, you know, fun and do a but campaign. So. Yeah. I love how you get involved in these campaigns and people know your face yeah. and they learn to love you as well because of your passion. I was even saying yesterday at the Masterclass in Brown Thomas. Yeah. People, I can speak for everyone in that room saying oh. you are so passionate and you believe in the science and we're like, I, I want that. Yeah. I want to no, buy that. It is, yeah. it, it, I mean, the it's science, it, it is amazing, actually, yeah. It, 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 honestly, it's so incredible kind of creating these products. When you come up with these products, with it, you know, with working with the scientists and innovating in that way, um, I just, it is, it is like for me, like giving birth to incredible things. And you're like, I just got to give this to the world. It's going to be such a difference. And then, you know, it, it's, um, and people really appreciate it. You know, like they, it just, it's, because it's so empowering makeup and great skincare. You know, skincare is just, if you want a beautiful painting, you have to have a beautiful canvas. You know, that can, to get that, because then the makeup will glide on in a completely different way. So, you know, the skincare and the makeup go together, and we're really big at both. And my scientists, are, we're constantly innovating. So, but, you know, you just do see, I mean, whenever, you know, whether I'm with a Mark Clooney or whoever on the red carpet, it's just that kind of, or a Salma Hayek, whoever it yeah. is, they're like, when there's a great product, like my new concealer that we're about to go and do a thing on, yeah. they just like, oh my God, what is this? Like, because they just see the difference yeah. of like blurring, smoothing, lifting. It's, it's incredible. And when you well, look amazing, you... you feel amazing. Yeah, exactly. You look amazing, feel amazing. Yeah. It's a virtuous circle. <laughs> that empowerment. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, right. And you are, so it's like you were saying, okay, like Twiggy and Kate Moss yes. friends for years and stuff like that. And then people do associate you with this glam lifestyle. And then yeah. recently, George Clooney and Amal, you oh, were in New York. Them. Love yeah. them. Yeah, you know, well, the, the Clooney Foundation for Justice, A, they're great friends, and it's amazing to support them. But they, they're so visionary, they're so brilliant, what they're doing, you know, defending kind of, you know, these, you know, defending human rights and people mm. who are defending, you know, that sort of, that justice, you know, justice for people, justice yeah. kind of um, was, was really, I have to say, in that room with them that night with, you know, Justice Albie Sachs, the kind of, the man that ended apartheid, you know, was just honestly such an honour to be there. It was the mm. most inspiring yeah. evening. Yeah. What they're doing, I mean, I have to say, those two human beings, they are, they're not only so beautiful and amazing, but what they're doing for the world is incredible. And, you know, defend, defending, Defending that really for all. Yeah, you know. it's incredible. Yeah. And lastly, like from New York to to Dublin now, you're yeah. an absolute jet setter. Tell us quickly about your Irish connection. You see your beautiful red hair. I know. Yes. I mean, so this is all the Irish genes. <laughs> the Irish genes came we out can of me. You claim Charlotte Tilbury. <laughs> you can. I'm getting my Irish passport next oh, month, so I'm really going to be Irish. Yeah. Exactly. No, I mean, I mean, it's so funny. I did. I had my DNA done, and you know, it, my sister is with you know, same mother, same father. 25% Irish and 40% Irish because my father's got Irish, Irish ancestry, and so does my mother. But they were like, "We're coming all oh, out in that God. girl." <laughs> so it was like all the genes came out of me in the red hair, which again was a kind of you know one of my ancestors because my parents aren't redheads. But it was like all the Irish genetics went. Chuk. That's why I love this country so much. Oh. I love the Irish. And, and everybody loves you. And the Clooney's, they are Irish we as well. Yes, exactly. So it's all the, I think we all just congregate together. We yeah. all the genetics. We fight exactly. Charlotte, it's always a pleasure uh, when. And you're here because you are great fun and um, it's a, just a, such a success story and congratulations. Oh, thank you and so may it much. Continue. And okay. you're staying with us. Yes. I'm staying tuned. with We've you, Tony. You're not getting class. rid of me. Yeah. I'm still going to be here. We can't get rid of you. <laughs> Sheridan is staying with us for a makeup masterclass shortly. Stay tuned. Uh, plus, uh, next, yes. we have top crime reporter Mick O'Toole on his debut detective novel inspired by the state's biggest criminal cases. We'll see you in a few minutes.
great to have you back. Our next guest is an award-winning crime reporter taking inspiration from the day job to make his very first novel. Yes, a journalist Mick O'Toole joins us now. Good morning to you, Mick. Hello. Lovely to chat to you. 22 years with the Irish Daily Mail as a, as a crime correspondent. Was crime correspondent always something you want to do to get into the crime section of journalism? Yeah, if I don't correct you that it's the Irish Daily Star, I'll be oh, sorry, the Irish Daily Star, Star, sorry. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> I, I grew up in, in Belfast and I was born in 1970, so I grew up with the Troubles. And like many Northerners, I would watch the news all the time. And he just developed a, a real fascination with, well, I don't even remember being in church in Ardoin in North Belfast. And there was a camera crew there when I was about eight. I just had that sort of gra and fascination mm. for it. And then when it was about 11 or 12, I watched a film called All the President's Men, which is a very famous film about journalism, about the, yeah. the water game. Yes, yeah. And, you know, I was staying up late. I probably shouldn't have been watching it. And I went, ooh, I like the look of this. So from the age of 11 or 12, I knew I wanted to be a journalist. So then, you know, I went to college, I studied languages, but I always wanted to be a journalist. So I got into journalism. I was a normal, ordinary journalist for seven years, but I gravitated towards crime. It's the most interesting aspect of journalism for me. I think it's the most difficult um, because a lot of journalists I know, they would have their contacts and they'd be chatting away to them and there wouldn't be any problems. My job is to talk to people who don't want to talk to me. Yeah. Either that be criminals or guards. Guards aren't allowed to talk to me. Criminals don't really want to talk to me. So it, it's quite difficult, but it, it's extremely challenging. And I, I, I find it very rewarding. It's incredibly rewarding. Everybody is, is obsessed with crime, aren't they? And murder, mm -hmm. murder mystery, the whole lot. But to be a journalist, like you're talking to people exactly who don't want to talk to mm -hmm. you. Do you mm -hmm. find, do you have a fear? Do you always have that in the back of your mind, constantly looking over your shoulder everywhere you go? Yes. Like one of the things I would do, say I work with a photographer, Mick O'Neill, when we're doing, we would call it a death knock. You're going up to knock on somebody's door after some, the victim has been murdered or if you want to confront the criminal. One of the things we would do, just a small thing, when we're driving into the estate or the housing development, we'll always drive past and come back so we're facing out of the estate rather than in if we have to get out of Dodge very quickly. No, and a couple really? of times we have, like, I mean, colleagues of mine have been, you know, they've had to reverse down Boreen's with a fellow with a rifle coming at them. You know what I mean? Oh, so it can get extremely hairy. So the first thing that we do is we always say, right, what is the danger? We do a risk assessment. Is there any risk here? And, you know, sometimes I would just go, right, it just doesn't feel right. I'm not doing this. But most of the time you do knock and, you know, sometimes you get grief. And what would the thing where you would go, no, this, I feel there's too much danger here? I'm a great believer in instinct. Right. Like, you know, say, for example, one of the most difficult things I find is, you know, look, we all do doorsteps and we all knock on doors but I, I find it difficult if there's a crowd of people outside can you imagine one person walking up by yourself and there's maybe 15 or 20 people outside a house now they, they could be perfectly normal but you say you're a journalist and things can yeah, just turn, turn like that and especially in crowds people lose their inhibitions I could talk to you one-on-one -on -one, but if there's 20 of you you know you know trying to pick just, it up type yeah, of you, thing, you yeah. try and pick up and yeah. you try and act hard in front of everybody and that can sometimes be a cause of conflict so I am wary of approaching crowds but you know, you look at, at every incident and every doorstep and every story in its own rights. And then I'm a firm believer, look, when it's me and the photographer, we decide, the, the news desk doesn't decide, the editors don't decide, we're in the field. Yeah. And if it's not worth it, if we get any bad vibes, we don't go near the place. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, look, and you've decided then to swap fact for fiction. Of course, your yes. new book, Black Light, is out. Um, why did you decide to go into the fiction and do you find that, given your experience in this crime world, it's the perfect lead-in to writing a book? Everything, my career as a crime reporter is in every page and every word of that book. Mm -hmm. So I haven't decided I'm going to fictionalise story X or story Y. I've got a million episodes in my head, a million vignettes, a million incidents, and they all, I've knitted them all together. So there, there are an awful lot of those uh, episodes in that book, which actually happened. Um, you know, so I, I've tried to, I wanted to make the book authentic because you know, when I'm doing a story, it's sort of, you know, you're, you're the first in, and sometimes you're the first in, and you don't really get time to stop and think. And with fiction, you're able to analyze characters and talk about people's reasoning. And yeah. a lot of people are interested in crime and violence. I, I get actually sick when I think about violence. And even when I was in school, I'd walk away from the fights when everybody was in the class. Mm -hmm. I, just, I just don't like violence. What I'm really interested in is the why. Why do people do this? So, I mean, I, the reason I call it black light, black light is what the guards use or law enforcement use, it's ultraviolet light. So when they're searching at scenes at night looking for blood or saliva, the normal light won't see. But the, the main hero in the book is a man called John Lazarus, a really damaged guard, a detective sergeant. 
And he's and based on a real detective. Oh, he is, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah, you uh, knew. Yeah, uh, that is a man called Detective Sergeant Mick Moran. He was, he's a detective sergeant in the guards, but he was for a while, he was in Interpol. He was uh, a leading child protection expert in Ireland. He organised, the, there's a, people call it child pornography. There's I call it. There he is. That, that's Mick. So this photograph is why I wrote the book. If you look carefully over on the left, uh, this is me interviewing Mick Moran yeah. in Interpol in France. Now, we've pixelated the, the screens because there's child abuse imagery on that. Right. He's, he's, that's what his job was. His was, wow. job was to hunt down pedophiles. But if you look to the left, there's a bookcase and you see the, the large earphones there. Yeah. yeah. I, I, was in, I was interviewing Mick and I said, Mick, what's the story with the earphones? Because they're very big. And he went, that's, I, I, watched, I use them when I'm watching the videos so nobody else can hear the babies or the children screaming. Oh, so it's God. a really tough job that Mick has to do. And that was in 2008, and I came away from that interview going, I'm going to have to write about a character like this. So he's the inspiration for the main character. But he's not like, you know, anybody who knows Mick Warren, he's very gregarious, very funny, very yeah. dedicated to his job. My John Lazarus hero is a bit more damaged and a bit, well, he's, he can be quite vicious sometimes, and he's driven, but he's damaged. So that was the inspiration for the character. But I have to admit that what crystallised the story was in 2015, I covered a very significant court case. You may remember a man called Graham Dwyer. Yes. Oh, yeah. yes. So that, that, yeah. that tr trial transfixed the nation. I covered it every single day. Yeah. He, he basically groomed a vulnerable lady called Elaine O'Hara for murder, mm. and he stabbed her to death uh, in the Dublin mountains and left her there. And I was sitting this close to Dwyer every day. And he fascinated me. He repelled and fascinated me, and I'll tell you why. He was an architect with a lovely middle-class family, had a slightly goofy hobby. He, was, he, he liked uh, model aircraft. And then he had a secret life as a sexual sadist and he compartment, compartmentalised everything, he hid everything. And for me, there was a darkness in him. I've covered, sadly, I've probably covered about 800 murders, homicides, maybe 1,500 deaths, car crashes, plane crash, all that sort of stuff, right? But with homicides, there are very few murders that are actually planned. And the difference between murder and manslaughter is you have intent. I'm going to kill yeah, you. Kill but you, you could murder. give somebody a smack yeah. and they could fall and hit their head and they're dead, uh, yeah, right? Yeah. But most murders aren't planned. Grim Dwyer planned that murder yeah. for, probably for several years. He had it in his med. He had a, fa a fascination with violence and, and raping women and stuff. So it was very rare for me to find someone like that who planned the murder. And uh, the reason and it came out the about black the black light, light then, that's yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Lazarus, inside, yeah. Lazarus believes there's a darkness in some people. I do as well. Wow. Look, I mean, I have to say, in my job, there's a darkness in me and a sadness in me because of what I've seen. And we never talk about this. Yeah. Journalists never talk about this. It doesn't affect you, mate. Of course, how could it not? Yeah. I mean, look at all those murders. I was up in Chrysler yeah. on Sunday. Now, I was only there for a day. And it's, it's, it's almost like photographers, they look through a viewfinder and it tries not to affect you. So I was there and you've got lots of things in your mind. You're trying to get stories, you're trying to ascertain the facts. But I can tell you, when I went home, I couldn't speak for an hour. Because yeah. it's just so overwhelming. Because so, you have three children I have well. three kids. Yeah. So my, my eldest is 17. So hope, please God she'll be going to college next year. I'll yeah. be a nervous wreck. And I think if you speak to any crime reporter or any reporters, like I was talking to Richard Chambers outside, mm. you know, he gets grief. He gets the same things that I get. He sees the same things nervous that, that I see. something might happen to her because well, of the contacts that people well, might yeah, know from I you. Mean, yeah, I mean, and there's one line in the book where Lazarus believes that he's a sort of sponge, that when he sees all the darkness and evil in, in the world, it, he's got two kids and he believes it'll sort of protect his kids and insulate them. I sort of think that myself. Yeah. If I see all this, it'll skip a generation and, you know, my kids will be sort of safe. Do you think what's going on at the minute, we have to mention this Hutch trial mm. at the, and, and um, the, the whole insider trial and Kinnahan's and everything else, Dowdell, sorry, I was meant to mention. Like, do you think this could make a great book? Like, our... Yes, I, I started writing Black Light. I came up with the idea after the trial of Dwyer in 2015. Now, it took me five years to do it, principally because I, be I became very, very busy with the Kin and Hutch feud. The yeah. Kin and Hutch feud started in September 2015 when a man called Gary Hutch, uh, Jerry the Monk mm. Hutch's nephew, was murdered in Spain. And then we had the, the, the Regency Airport Hotel attack in February 2016. And from then, for two years, the last murder was in January 2018. And it was non-stop. I, ha I think that the, the Hutch attack and the Kinahan response was a direct threat to the state. Wow. It's, it's the most serious gangland crisis we had since the murder, murder of Ronnie Gagarin in 1996. Yeah. It was really, really mm -hmm. easy. So there are so many different elements to it. I know that there is a, a docudrama being made at the minute about the, the feud, but it's, per I mean, I, you know, when I was writing this, 
there were some of those things that happened in the feud, say men dressing up as guards and yes, pretending to be yeah, yeah. I couldn't have made that up. Yeah. Yeah. In the worst, in the best fiction, mm. no, I would. I tried to make my and book as realistic as possible. I couldn't put that in because I just wouldn't have imagined it. I suppose this is why, as you said, when you're doing journalism, getting into crime, it's the sort of stuff that you just couldn't imagine where it's going to go. But the fact that then you've now turned it into a fictional book is just incredible as well. Nick, we could have talked to you all morning. Yeah. Your new book, Back, Black Light, is out. It's available now in shops. And, uh, and right to the Irish yeah. Daily Star. There you go. <laughs> Get that right. <laughs> uh, Mick, thanks Accuracy so much. is very important. For joining us. I really appreciate thanks it. Thanks very much. Uh, now, Cathy, what else have we got to look forward to? Tommy, we have the makeup artist to the stars, Charlotte Tilbury. <laughs> She'll be giving us a masterclass and giving us that gorgeous look. <laughs> Thank blend. you, darling. See you after the break. <laughs> Girls and guys, it's time to get your glow on. Charlotte Tilbury is back with some beauty basics now. Teach the nation. Right, darlings, <laughs> I am going to show you. OK, so this is how to get beautiful, radiant skin. And we're just going to pop that. These are my amazing tricks. This concealer will change your life. You now, so is gonna... this the technique we should be using? This like is the technique upward. we should be using, exactly, because this well, this concealer has the power of an eye cream and the power of a concealer. It's like shapewear for the eyes yeah. and face. So imagine what shapewear nose. does. Yeah. It conceals, it smooths, and it brightens. So if we put it there in the inner corner and now here on the outer corner, and let me just show you. Can you see on half it's, the face here? We've like already done facelift. it. It's like a facelift. It's like a facelift. It's like an eye lift and a facelift. So you just pop that in there. We're just going to smooth that in and you can do it with your finger and we're going to lift that up here and just see what that does it just lifts and brightens and conceals and smooths like just like and shapewear. I noticed you don't put any concealer directly under the eye why is that well actually we could put it in the inner corner because as we blend it across mm -hmm. actually here's where we want to bounce the light and in the inner corner, and then as we blend it together, and it will just give you that gorgeous wow. lift. And how can people know what shade to find? What's the perfect shade of concealer? Is it two well, shades up or...? We actually, we normally do one shade up, so one to shade. your foundation. Okay. One shade up to your foundation nice. to just give you that brightening effect. But this is one of those tricks, and I swear to you, it just makes the biggest difference. The eye lift effect, the face lift effect, it just is incredible. This is the how to wow concealer. I've never tried it near the I lip mean, line. I'm going to do that tomorrow. It really gives you a lip. <laughs> now I'm going to give you that airbrush skin. So this is a great kind of, in Hollywood, we love this. And on all the fashion shoots, this celebrities go nuts for. It really and is. And what does this do? So this is, gives you that airbrush powdered skin. So that's smooth. I mean, again, we know that the camera, you know, as we know, Catches we all everything. want airbrush skin. And this powder just gives you that airbrush that's poreless, flawless. Look, now I'm going to show you how to get the bronze glow. Now, this is amazing, this product. OK, so what we do, this is going to give you, get this bronzer, pop it across the forehead, where the right. sun would naturally hit you, yeah. over the nose and here, across the cheekbones there. And this and is that the will... same as contouring. This is the, this is actually where... The, this is giving you that kind of airbrush bronzy glow. Okay. So all, like, giving you that sort of suntanned, bronzy kind of Californian look in the wintertime. Um, but then... so And then suck in your cheekbones, darling. So you go across the temples, across here where the sun would naturally hit you, across the jawline, and then you suck in the cheekbones if you want a little bit more. And that will give you that hollow... That will give you cheekbone lift, follow Super. the hollow here. All of the different face shapes different. in the world, all exactly. we need to do is pull in our lips. Pull it, exactly. And okay. then, now I'm going to give you a little bit of a beautifying face palette. This is divine, Lord. this, OK? Oh, my God, Again, the shimmers. The shimmers, the shimmers. So now we're going to give you this with a little now a smile for me, darling, on the apple of the cheek. You can see here on this side, darling, can you see where we've done it? And we've got that gorgeous glow. It's literally shining it, it just, from the space. I'm obsessed. Exactly. So I'm just showing you how we've done this side and we have haven't done the other side so we're just putting it on now and we're just going to pop that on the top of the cheekbone and what this do you gorgeous think glow with with glows and blushes what's what are the common Look mistakes me, people might do when it comes to this part of makeup well, I think, they, so I think a lot of people, I mean, I have to say the quality of the formula is key. Yeah. That will give you that amazing candlelit, you know, that gorgeous yes. candlelit skin that we've got over here. It really is the quality of the formula that will give you that amazing glow. And again, the colours, the kind of gold, golden, golden, peachy kind of pinks that will give you those kind of gorgeous colours. I'm obsessed, obviously, with colour and science and the texture of the yeah. formula. Because not every glow, some glows will sit in the lines, sit in the pores, 
We don't uh, want that. We do not we want, want that. that. We no. want smoothing, stretch, candlelit mm -hmm. skin Poor that makes you skin. look like satin skin. Yes. That makes you look younger. So we're just popping that on. And there. do you usually mix the blush me, with glow at the same time? That's a good combination. I like to do yeah. that because then the blush, you have that on the apples of the cheek here. You get that. Now I'm just going to pop that across the here. And you get that. Look straight for me, sweetie. And you just, you get the pinkiness, but you get that lip from within candlelit yeah. skin. I have to say, I was, oh, I'd be afraid to use like as much product. But when you're applying it yeah. now, it looks so, so seamless. natural. So natural. Yeah. No, and darling, this is absolutely, completely effortless. Very, you know, my five-year-old son could do it almost. A five-year-old, he's not, he's not, he's now, now he's nine, nearly nine. <laughs> so, my gosh, there we go. Stunning, absolutely stunning. Look, look at that, darling. Look at what oh, that wow. does. Yes. And now do we, that in. what do we do after this stuff? Do we usually set or? So you... what we do now, okay, so I mean, always, if you want a beautiful painting, you've got to have a beautiful canvas. So I have to say before this, I've always put on an incredible moisturizer, which is really, 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 really key. And then we have, um, I then have a setting spray, which actually I don't have here right now. But, but I, I know, I know all about it. You know all about know, it, darling. I've got if you want today, guys. I mean, exactly. <laughs> if you want your makeup to stay in place all day, all night, you need the setting spray. Exactly. So just pop popping that on. Look at me, darling. Gorgeous. Absolutely, Absolutely. gorgeous. And then Stunning. we don't have exactly the lip, but that is stunning. And then this airbrush skin, we're going to pop that in there. Want to finish off. Well, you really guys, see. you can literally see from the screen here from home, like how she is glowing from space. I am obsessed. <laughs> and this is a perfect daytime and nighttime look. It you know? is, it yeah. is, it is indeed. And I mean, you could even take this and put this in the corner. So I love to use this on the eyelids to get, look at that glow that wow. it will give you that. And that will just make your eyelids pop here. And then we can take this and use it in the inner corners of the eye. So this palette just, and I do this a lot on a lot of styles, like Jennifer Aniston, Amar, like just open up your eyes, darling. It's that really one palette just for all. really yeah. give you that brightness. Amazing. Well, Charlotte, I have to say to thank you so much for, for teaching us that is all for today. And we oh. and we will be turning to Tommy thank and Alan you. for tomorrow. Hey guys, well done, well done, Charlotte. Well done, Charlotte. Looking gorgeous. See you so, tomorrow. Yeah.